<laughs> so uh, we're, um, we're in this season as a city um, that's been called The Breaking. And so a number of churches have gotten together. Some of the, the uh, kind of movements of unity in the city decided to call uh, a season, a 21-day season of prayer and fasting on behalf of our city. And in that, they, they're focusing on Isaiah 61 and, and Nehemiah 9, um, and, and really leaning into what does God want to do and how do we see our city transformed. So I wanted to take uh, a kind of little pause before we jump into any next series and just look at Isaiah 61. Um, that's the basis of this season. We had uh, a fun time here on Thursday night with some people here worshiping. Um, there's going to be a big worship event this Wednesday night at 6.30 at Emmanuel Church which will be fantastic with some great worship leaders from around the city. There'll be more worship here on Thursday. So we're leaning into this call that's been offered to the city. ...this and explore, like, what, what does this passage mean? And what is it that these people are really asking us to engage citywide? And before I read it, I just want to remind us of the context. So we've got this prophet, Isaiah, a man called... Uh, it, uh, called to speak this message uh, to the nation of Israel. And, and the book of Isaiah, really the first 39 chapters, I think it's interesting. Isaiah has 66 chapters. There's 66 books in the Bible. There's a transition that happens. There's 39 chapters that are all about judgment and hope. There's 39 books in the Old Testament. And then there's 27 chapters that are all about this messianic age, and there's 27 books in the New Testament. I think that's a really interesting little fact. Um, so they begin in the first 39 chapters, Isaiah is declaring this message of judgment mixed in with the hope that's coming as he's condemning Israel and the surrounding nations for their failure. Mixed in amongst it is this hope that a solution is coming, and then the last chapters from, from 40 onwards are really looking at this messianic age, and it's, it's filled with these these moments of, of prayer and poetry um, that, that help us understand what it is that the Messiah is going to do. And so in the middle of these prophecies and, and the poetry, um, we reach Isaiah 61, which is the focus for this morning. So I want to read it um, in its entirety, and then we'll jump back through and look at it in a little bit more detail. So this is a passage that should be really familiar just such a blessed part of Scripture. So Isaiah 61, starting at verse 1, says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will will rejoice in your inheritance so that you will inherit a double portion in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he hath clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Man, 
Such a beautiful and powerful passage, especially when we, when we sit back and allow it to speak over us, over our lives, and over the city that we're part of. So there's a couple of things as we're going to go through it that I want to draw attention to. It's just kind of basic Bible study. Um, I want you to pay attention to the contrasts. So this is one of these passages that's really set in the form of poetry. Um, and so all the way through, there's contrast being made between the sin of the world and, and the hope of, of this messianic age. All the way through as he's describing, he, he works this beautiful poetry, you know, crown of, of beauty instead of ashes. So, so contrast is all the way through. Um, it's also a device called parallelism, where they're taking two sentences, they make them parallel, so they're basically using synonyms to try and help us understand more fully what it is that's happening. And in this passage, as I said, it's all, about, um, it's all about the damage that's caused by sin, although that's not explicitly said, we see it. So the passage is talking about the damage that sin has wrought on the earth, and then the restoration and the healing and the wholeness that comes through Jesus Christ. Um, the other theme that's all the way through the book of Isaiah is the contrast between Jerusalem as it currently is at their time, a nation that's rebelled against the Lord, and the new Jerusalem that will come that will define the age of the Messiah and the hope that we're longing for. And even that is pointing ahead to the new creation that we get to participate in. So as we're looking through this, it's talking about Jerusalem as it was. It's talking about a messianic age that is to come. But then as part of that, as people who are walking in the, the footsteps of Jesus empowered by his spirit, there's an element of this work that we get to do in the world today as we bring the, the promises of this messianic age to bear on the city round about us. So let's look back at Isaiah, the beginning of 61. You know, the sovereign, the, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. So those who know the word well know that when Jesus was on the earth after his baptism and after his temptation, he makes his way to Nazareth. He stands up in the temple uh, and they're in the middle of reading through the scroll of Isaiah and they've gotten quite far through and they just happen to be at this passage. And Jesus stands up and he changed, I'm sure he changed the intonation when he read it. I'm sure it sounded like this. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me. I don't think he left it like ambiguous. I think he was making it really clear what he was doing. This was his first sermon I, in your Bible. Like I would say go and capitalize the word me. Um, because this is Isaiah speaking, and in the process of speaking, he's speaking and prophesying what Jesus would do when he came. And then as we've talked about in the last, the full last sermon series on sent, uh, there's the capital me, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord has sent Jesus to do a certain work, but then there's us as the continuation of his work in the world that's gonna, gonna do this work. But what is it that, that he was sent to do? We know this, we read this at Advent, this is a common passage, but I just wanna bring us back to the heart of it. What was he done? He was anointed. What's the word for anointed in Hebrew? It's the word from which we get Messiah. It's Mashach, Mashiach is Messiah. So he's been anointed. I am the anointed one that's been sent to proclaim good news to the poor. And this word that's, that's used to say proclaim good news, it, I mean, it literally is saying it's something exciting and positive for the people. Um, but it's good news to the poor, the humble, the afflicted, the meek, the lowly. So he's coming in to a worldly system that, that, is, that is celebrating strength and power and glory and saying the good news I bring are to the lowly and the meek. He says, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Literally, I'm going to bandage the things that are wounded. I'm going to bandage the people that are broken, that have been oppressed, that have been crushed. The word here for brokenhearted, like the, the root verb, they reckon literally means to burst. So I'm going to bind up the things that have burst because they've been so damaged and hurt. 
He goes on to proclaim freedom to captives and release from darkness for prisoners. So he's, he's talking in two levels as he's speaking because what's he talking about when he's talking about captives and prisoners? Isaiah has been prophesying that Assyria is going to come, that Babylon is going to come, that because of the sin and hard-heartedness of Israel, they're going to be led out into captivity. They're going to be put in chains. They're going to be made captive in a foreign land. Their hearts are going to be broken. They're going to be the meek and the lowly. And he's promising that that's not the way it's going to stay. Release is coming. Freedom will come. And so he's saying, this is the job we're going to do. I am telling you now to the people of Israel, you're going to go into captivity, but there's going to be release. Again, he's prophesying. There's going to be a greater spiritual captivity that the world is caught in that Jesus is going to come to release us from. He goes on to talk about this year of the Lord's favor. Uh, the year of jubilee, this year, I mean, that's where Jesus stops. He doesn't go on to the next part. The year of jubilee, like there's so much in this that we could talk about and unpack. But the thing I think where we feel it the most and would feel the most joy if this was us, the day every one of your debts was relinquished. You don't have to clear your mortgage anymore. You don't have to pay your student debts anymore. You don't have to clear off the, your, your uh, credit cards. This is the day when all of that stuff was just going to be wiped clean in an instant, right? The year of Jubilee was the day where everyone was liberated. So he's proclaiming a day where all debt is relinquished. Looking ahead again to Christ and his work on the cross when all our sin, all our death, all our brokenness is relinquished. So this is Jesus in his work. It's him declaring to us that this is how my ministry is defined. And as always, we've got to stop and ask the question. When we look at our ministry personally, when we look at our ministry as a church, when we look at the ministry of the church in the West, does this depict the kind of ministry that we're doing in the world? Um, is it? It goes on. <laughs> um, I'm going to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the year of vengeance for the, the day of vengeance for the Lord. I'm going to comfort all who mourn, provide for those who grieve in Zion, and then these beautiful contrasts to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. When I read a line like that, I find I find myself thinking about Esther. You've got Mordecai in sackcloth and ashes in front of the palace gates because this decree has been made by Haman that, that uh, they're going to wipe out the Jewish people. And in the middle of that whole storyline, Esther is chosen, this beauty queen that's brought in to the palace and given a crown. And you see that story play out where the ashes and the sackcloth are turned into a crown of beauty. I can't help but see some of those. I don't think that's what the writer's alluding to, but I just see the parallel. Um, the oil of joy will be given instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. Do you see what's happening in this passage? A crown of beauty, oil of joy, and a garment of praise. Who got those things in the Old Testament? Who was given the crown and the anointing oil and the garment? There's two groups of people. The king as he's anointed and crowned as the one who's supposed to lead the nation of Israel. But the word here for crown of beauty is actually the word headdress. Um, so it could also be referring to the priestly caste who are given their robes and their garments, their headdress, they're covered in oil, and they're given the task of mediating to the people. So this is not just you get ashes and mourning and despair. This is you're coming from rock bottom and being brought to a place where you are leading and mediating and ruling for God and his people. Uh, I think it's easy to miss this in here. We just get caught up in the, the beautiful poetry of, hey, I'm mourning, so now I'm going to have gladness. But th this is more statement of identity that God has given us as he's taking us from, from the, the result of sin in the world, which is our brokenness and our pain and our fear and our despair. And he's doing the great reversal where he brings us to that place of beauty and joy and praise. He finishes this section, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And I want to just get us set up for what is coming. Why does he suddenly start calling us trees? <laughs> because everything he's about to talk about is going to talk about the land of desolation and drought. So he's setting up what's coming next. You guys are going to be these fruit-bearing trees 
the symbol of life in contrast to the death and destruction that we're seeing in the world round about us. Um, and, and, and how does it happen? Because he's at work. He does the calling. He does the planting. And he does it all for his splendor. So at the end of the day, Jesus inaugurates his ministry with a sermon. And, and the normal Jewish person who's familiar with Scripture, what happens is Jesus begins a quote in the Old Testament. And everybody else knows what comes next. You know, if I say, turn your eyes upon Jesus... You know the line that comes next, right? Look full in his wonderful face. Um, there are certain things that we have where we know what comes next. For them, they knew what was coming next. So Jesus was defining the whole of his ministry. And we've said this so many times in so many different ways. We are an extension of Christ in the world. So Isaiah 61 should be part of our personal mission statement. If Jesus can stand up and say, this is the kind of person I want to be in the world, we have to look at this passage and say, I want this to mark my life as I move out into the world. We are an extension of Christ in the world, carrying on this work. Uh, he's the head, we are the body, um, he's at the right hand of the Father, and we are his instruments in the world bringing this to bear. So the passage goes on, if we think about it, this is telling us what it looks like when the church is an extension of Christ and we're called to do this rebuilding work in the world. We play this work of redemption and restoration. So he says in verse 4, these people, they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. The promise of Christ is this reversal that the things that have been devastated and ruined and damaged and destroyed can be transformed. They can be renewed. They can be rebuilt. They can be restored. And he's talking city-wide with the, 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 the city of Jerusalem. That's, they're going to be taken into exile. The temple's going to be destroyed. The walls are going to be ripped down. But he's also talking about what's happening in the world today. And he's talking about who we are as people. What's the devastation in your life? What's the wreckage that you've experienced? What's the devastation that you've walked in? God is promising that he's the God who can rebuild what's been broken in you. He can renew uh, what has been torn down. And, and not just the things happening now, but the things that have been happening for generations. So when I look at Portland, I go, what in the Portland metro area is the brokenness and devastation that's been happening for generations? God is calling the church to step into the work of rebuilding and renewing and restoring his will in the city that we're a part of. Here's the thing, though. We need to be constructive people. What do I mean by that? He's talking about rebuilding, restoring. He's using the language of building and making. We are very guilty in the church of criticizing and tearing down right? I'm guilty, <laughs> I'm going to say. Um, but what ends up happening is we see issues in the world that don't align with how we believe Scripture wants things to be. And so our primary posture becomes one of criticism. That's not the way God wants it. The way they did that was not right, and it's okay when God's calling us to have a prophetic voice to say those things against culture, but we can't do that if we're not going to do the next step, which is provide a constructive solution or a constructive alternative. So right now, we're in the aftermath of what's just happened in Afghanistan. We're looking at this crazy takeover of the country by the Taliban, and all over the world, all over the media, all over Facebook, and in my own heart, we're looking at the government and going, what did you do? How could you not see this? How could you not put more in place? That's criticism. Here's the challenge for you as believers. Whenever you want to criticize and you go on Facebook to do it, provide a constructive solution. So do this. I think Joe Biden made a complete mess of this. If I was in his shoes, this is what I would have done. And here's the deal. It's a lot easier to criticize than it is to come up with a national plan for what you would do with the military and helping another country stand on its own feet against 
uh, an organization that's not loved. It's a lot easier. We take the shortcut and we say, let's just criticize it. But what about the solution? We look and we go, look in Portland. Look what Kate Brown's done. There's homelessness everywhere. There's these tent cities come up. There's trash everywhere. It's horrible. Our city's going to pot. What you should be saying is, I see the problem in our city. Here is what I would do to solve it. And what happens when I take that posture is I find myself walking in a lot of humility because I do not have a clue. I don't know how to fix the problem. (laughs) I wish I did. I have some solutions. If I was to post them on Facebook, I'm sure everyone would be like, that's dumb. (laughs) Which is why I don't post them. It's easier just to critique than post them and have someone else critique what we suggest. But this whole passage is saying to the church that you're called to be builders. We're not called. It doesn't say you're called to be criticizers of the society round about. It says we have a prophetic voice to preach the good news, to proclaim freedom, to heal the brokenhearted, uh, to minister to the community round about us, but then we're called to play a role in rebuilding. Um, and that's the harder work. And no one person can do it, and no one church can do it, which is why I'm always encouraging us to be praying for unity amongst the churches in the city and to be partnering with the unity movement that happens in our city to bring constructive solutions to the damage and things that are out there. So, so how are you doing with that? There's a professor at Multnomah, Rob Hildebrand. He, he's over the youth ministry program. And I love his Facebook engagements. Through the election, he, his, his posts are like hundreds of comments long. And he'll watch a presidential debate. And as he's watching it, he'll, he'll write, Trump just said this. And, then, and, and he's like, I don't agree. I would do, 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 do. Biden just said this. I don't think that's going to work. I would do, 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 do. And he just gives us commentary of like, here's how I would engage. And then all the people that are friends with him on Facebook are responding, Rob, I think that's a great idea. I don't think it'll work in reality. That's because you're Canadian. Uh, And there's all these comments um, coming back and forth. But, But he's trying to engage constructively and encourage us to come up with solutions rather than just criticizing the problem. So, so here's the deal. When you see a problem that riles you, Part of that may be, part of it may be your flesh and just saying, I have an issue here and I want to fix it to be the way I want it. There's a high chance part of that is the work of the Spirit in your life creating in you a discontent with the brokenness. Perhaps in the area that you're most frustrated is the area where God wants you to release you to be a builder and construct an alternative solution in the world. Um, And then what's that going to mean for us as a church? It's going to mean what are the issues that we're broken over, that we're frustrated by, and then how as a community do we pull our resources, our thought processes, our creativity, and our energy and go out there to make a difference? We're not just called to be constructive. We're actually called to go beyond that in the role that we play. So it goes on in verse 5 and 6. You know, you'll rebuild ancient ruins, restore the places, renew the ruined cities. Um, Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. You will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. And you will feed on the wealth of nations and the riches you will boast. So as part of this, it's not just that we're called to be humanitarian people in the world constructing better solutions to the problems that are out there, um, we're actually given the role and identity of priests and rulers in the kingdom. And again, this is, this is as with where we're going, I think these pieces are so important. That's why I keep coming back to the same elements. We're called to be priests. What does he say in 1 Peter? As you come to him, the living stones rejected by, by uh, humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a, a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to talk about this stumbling stone. He says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you would declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. This is the identity that we've been given. And as Isaiah is writing to the people, uh, 
they don't understand what it means to be a holy priesthood and a royal nation because they've got one caste of people within their society that get to be priests. The thought of everybody being a priest is ridiculous to them. So this is looking ahead to us as priests, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. I put it this way, we're called to be worshipful mediators. We're called to mediate the presence of God to the world. We're called to mediate his heart to the broken. We use the language when we talk about being intercessors. We stand in the gap between God and the brokenness of the world. There's a homeless issue. Let me stand in the gap between your houselessness and the God that has the solution. Um, we're looking at atrocities and brokenness around the world. Let's stand in the gap. So we're called to mediate the presence of Jesus. We're called to mediate his spirit. We're called to mediate his heart through our words and our actions. And we're called to do it worshipfully. The language that he says, he says, um, you'll be called priests of the Lord. You'll be named ministers of our God. And then in, in First Peter, that you would declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. I think we've lost sight often of the calling that we have as priests and ministers in the world. And part of that is we pay a pastor to stand at the front, and then internally that makes us do this thing where we go, that's the pastor. I am a churchgoer who's called to live out my faith in the world. You are called to be a pastor and a priest and a minister as much as I am. The only difference is where your salary comes from, right? Uh, so we're all called to be people who see ourselves as pastors in the world, who see ourselves as priests in our community. So when someone is sick, we don't find the pastor to come and help pray for them. You go pray for them. You don't find uh, someone else to come in and do the work of, of preaching the gospel. You go do the work of preaching the gospel. You don't leave Dave up here to do the worshiping. Uh, we enter into the posture of worship. Uh, we are worshipful mediators in the world. That's what we're called to be. Um, how are you doing at mediating the presence of Jesus and his vision to the world? As he goes on into verse 7, he says this, Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance, so that you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. There's this promise here that as we're doing this work in the world of fixing the brokenness and mediating the healing power of Jesus to the world around about us, that our own brokenness and hardship is going to be redeemed in the process. So we've always got to remember as we're reading this, we're dealing with two, really three time periods. This is him writing to people that are going to be exiled and they're going to be in shame and disgrace, losing the land that was to be their inheritance. So he's saying to them, instead of that shame, you're going to come into a double inheritance and a place of honor in this new creation that God has for us. But then he's talking ahead to the messianic age, which includes us today. And so he's saying to you, instead of the shame that you carry, God wants to give you a double portion of blessing and honor. In the areas of your life where you have been disgraced and where you feel disgrace, he's going to enable you to rejoice in the inheritance that he's given you. This language of blessing and honor. What was the double portion? What was that? It was the, the, the portion of inheritance given to the firstborn who was going to carry on the family name and be the leader and the patriarch within the family. So this is a declaration of leadership and honor in the world that's going to come through the reversal of your shame and brokenness being turned into gladness and joy and celebration as he works in you uh, to do transformation. So, so what is the shame that you're carrying? What's the disgrace that you want to see undone? Uh, are there things in your life where you look at them and you go, I can never escape this. It just weighs me down forever. God wants to take that. And, and as we submit it to him, give us a double portion and blessing. So, so there's two things that are happening in this part of the passage. One's, one is the promise that we will experience transformation. Um, so look at your life, look at where you fall short, look at where you're stuck, look at where you're ashamed. Uh, transformation is promised. 
Uh, and part of the beauty of the Messianic community is that we welcome people of all states of brokenness and mess, and we say, come and find a place here and let us love and accept you in your brokenness and shame uh, so that you can experience the everlasting joy that comes. So that's what I want for each of you. Um, that's one part of it. The other part, does anyone know this symbol? <laughs> Sing the song. Transformers, robots in disguise, right? <laughs> Transformers, right? We are transformers in the world. Um, I put that there just to make this stick. We, God promises that we will experience transformation in our life, but our role as we go out into the world is to be transformers. What does this look like? People who are transformers walk into the world. You receive persecution, you turn it into blessing. Bless those who persecute you. You receive hurt from other people. You transform it into love as you love the people around about. You see the brokenness in the world. You come alongside to transform it into a healing presence of God. We absorb debts done uh, against us. And sometimes physically and materially, we help absorb the debts of other people and we transform it into freedom and forgiveness. What, would it, what do you think would happen if in the world, Christians had a soft enough heart and a thick enough skin that when someone criticized us, our first response was to turn around and, and return blessing? That if someone comes and attacks us for something that we believe, we just absorb it and we pour out love. Uh, what would happen if we look at the brokenness out in the world and rather become overwhelmed with it and criticize it? We got our gloves on and we roll up our sleeves and we get out there and we make a difference. And uh, we're called to be transformers in the world. In this COVID season, we absorb fear. You know, there's two types of fear we're wrestling with right now regarding COVID. There, there's a lot of people think fear, well, here's the deal. Everyone thinks the fear's on the other side. So I was in a great conversation with someone the other day. Those people that are giving in to fear and they're getting the vaccine. They shouldn't get the vaccine. The government's trying to control us. I'm like, so what are you scared of? <laughs> the control of the government? That, that, that they're going to chip you? That there's going to be these consequences down the line that you don't know? So this group over here, and it is, a large part of our population are dealing with fear. I'm fearful of what will happen if I catch COVID, so I'm going to get the vaccine. You've got a group of people here going, I'm fearful of what the government and people out there are trying to do, so I'm not going to get the vaccine. Now, not everyone is in those camps, but we're all reacting in fear and then acting out of it. And then we're criticizing the other group. Oh, you conspiracy theorist, look at that. Oh, you fearful person, look at that. And we're, at the end of the day, we're walking in the same issue. What would it look like if in this season the church absorbed fear and returned faith? The government's out to get us. Cool. Jesus is in control. There's no authority except that which God has established. Like Jesus is enthroned and he's at the right hand of the Father and everything's going to be changed. You're fearful that you might die from COVID. Do you know what? There's life after death. There's redemption for our brokenness. There's hope in the middle of the fear. Let's be people who are transformers in the world, absorbing the negativity and returning positive solutions. Last part of the passage. At the end of the day, if I summarize this, it's all for his glory. This is verse 8. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the people. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I think there's a lot of people in the world right now looking at the church and saying, that's not a very fun life. You don't look like a very blessed person. I don't want a whole lot to do with that because we're just as fearful, we're just as worried, we're just as critical uh, as the people out there. 
Um, what do we need to do as we walk with Jesus so that people will look at us and go, man, your faith in the middle of hardship, your joy in the middle of suffering, you're so blessed. Um, he goes on. Isaiah says, I, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation, and he's arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all the nations. This beautiful reminder at the end that it's not us who do the work. It's not us who make ourselves priests and kings in the kingdom. It's the God who grants us the garment of salvation. But what do you do when someone gives you a garment? You have to put it on. Right? So he is gifting us salvation. We have to put it. He's arraying us with righteousness. We have to put it on. Why do I say that? Because the next part, a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest. The bride adorns herself with jewels. So God has made these resources available. Are you adorning yourself in them? Or are you adorning yourself in the things of the world? And then as he goes on, as he finishes, you know, the soil makes the sprout come up. The garden causes the seeds to grow. The sovereign Lord makes righteousness happen in our hearts, in our church, and in the city that, that we're a part of. And it's, it's a, a justice and a righteousness and a glory that will be visible to everybody. Um, so we're in this beautiful spot where he has declared to us his mission in the world. He's declared to us his transformative power that's available in the world. He's exhorting us to be transformers that are helping take the negative things in the world and transform it into the way of his kingdom. And then he leaves us with this invitation, are you going to walk in it? I am adorning you. I've given you the identity. I've paid the price to make it possible for you. I've paid the price to make it possible for all of the world to receive this. Will you take the garments and put them on? Will you adorn yourself with the things of the kingdom, of the messianic kingdom, and walk that out into the world?